you've got a, like a whole bunch of like secretarial women assembling the podcast in a back room. Yes, huh. we should right be so away, lucky. Mr. Rosniak. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we've got the secretary from John Wick doing this. <laughs> what? A, I wish I had someone to just just uh, yeah, just a whole whole room of like you know tape drives going back and forth that assembles the podcast <laughs> manually for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can simulate the the noise. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um. Well, I started. I started my, you know what, I should also check and make sure I have enough room on the hard drive. I that would, that would be smart, that would be smart. I'm going to buy a new hard drive, but before I give it to you, I'm going to stuff it in your it. mouth. Do you want to, mm, do you want a sync point? No. I think we should uh, be nah, Zencaster fine. already Shut works. Because oh, I, nice, cool. I do the screen recording, which means I have a continuous sync point. Yeah, unless mm. you lose the video file. Who would yes. do that? Oh. Roz, you did that. That was the joke. In some kind of... 2022 bug scenario. Absolutely. Yes. The the bug is me trying to free up space on my hard drive. Why don't you take <laughs> the hard drives I've already given you? I uh, because I don't know where they are. A room oh full God. of hard drives. Oh you, you add one to the pile every time you come bedroom. over. There's literally one in his room. I could I know Wait, where Liam, it is. Liam, you've Start given me so podcast. many computer parts. Start I don't know what any podcast. of them are. Start, Start the, the podcast. podcast. We're starting Start the-, the podcast. Oh, we've been recording for a minute and a God damn it, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> you sneaky bastard. Well, hello, and welcome to Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides. I'm Justin Rosniak. I'm the person who's talking right now. My pronouns are he and him. O- okay, go. I am Alice Goldor Kelly. I'm the person who's talking now. My pronouns are she and her. Yay, Liam. Hey Liam, hi, I'm Liam Anderson, my pronouns are he and him, and we have a guest! Yes. Hello, my name is Abigail Thorne, my pronouns are she and her. Is that THE Abigail Thorne from Philosophy the Tube? Abby Thorne. Wow, yes. <laughs> How do we get her? From Jesus. Kill James Bond? From Kill James Bond? Oh, you know, I, I, I heard Kill James Bond is a good, a good show, except that one of the hosts uh, owes me 40,000 US dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I told you I was going to pay you that after you show me proof of the body. Oh. No, I was... Yeah, that too. Can I also have $40,000 from you and we'll get this speedboat underway? <laughs> Abby, I just want to thank you for being the first person to put philosophy in a tube. Because it used thank to you. be... Where it belongs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it used to be, you know, you're in the kitchen, you're in the kitchen, you're making a recipe, it calls for some philosophy, and it's mm-hmm. like four ounces, right? You have to yeah. go get a can, and the can's like eight ounces. Could so use a can just have this, them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then you and then you have like just this half empty can of philosophy Are in the fridge. Are you implying that Abby is some sort of Pillsbury Grand's biscuits? And then <laughs> and then and then you have to put plastic wrap on it. But now yeah. it's in a tube; you can just squeeze it out. Exactly, it's yeah. great. Like a homogenous. Well, I'm I'm glad that you found it useful. Oh yeah, you people are fucking freaks. But we've brought you on to talk about. Y two K. Some of some of our listeners are too young to remember this, which depresses the absolute Don't shit out that. of Don't me. So I, those I definitely. I mm, Abby, how old are you? Uh, <laughs> she's 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 a child. Is the thing we're I mean, using child she, labor? Is she? <laughs> Okay. Not remembering uh, the year two thousand. <laughs> yeah, I'd, 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 yeah, I'd have to like. I have to I don't, like remember that at all <laughs> i'd have to check a box on youtube i'm gonna throw up dude <laughs> <laughs> but we have some helpful images here uh, yes. of the 2000s you, you guys do the this late podcast 90s. i need to lie down yeah. Yeah, um <laughs> and and the sort of cultural moment that was the y2k computer bug mm-hmm. um because of course, as a Zoomer, I dress in Y two K fashion, and somebody said that the other day, and I was like, "What does that mean? Do you mean it was it's something like, else before wh- wh- this? Wh- wh- what is this? Because I'm mean, there only, was a time, you know, mm-hmm. twenty one. <laughs> when you know, there was a time when people didn't go on the computer. You're twenty one. You're twenty goddamn one. <laughs> you could log off yeah, instead of being logged off all the time. You had wow. a dial up connection. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, twenty eight baud modems, man. Yeah. Uh, I do want to say. Uh, you know, we we do get the occasional requests for sort of well, there isn't your problem for the disasters that weren't, and I don't know if this is an official entry in that, but like spiritually, the, spiritually, yeah. well, the apocalyptic uh, messaging surrounding it 
and what it ended up being is certainly, I think, on that level. Yeah, we have we have the weekly world news here on the bottom yes. right, which tells us that hundreds of planes will fall out of the sky, cars will stop dead in their tracks, nuclear missiles will launch themselves. If only, man. Yeah, I mean, like the the headline says the final days, and it's like, and then also inside Armageddon. So you get both. You get two for the price of one there. Yeah, you even get an Escaton free. Yes. <laughs> but before we imminentize that. We have to do the goddamn news. Oh, that was good, you two. Yes. So, so the 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 American trucker convoy has fallen hilariously flat, defeated by the Beltway. De- defeated, <laughs> defeated, defeated by just being scared of going into Washington DC. There was, there was there was an interview about this that I saw with one of the truckers where he was like, "Well, I was going to drive into Washington DC, but then three girls in a blue Hyundai gave me the finger really aggressively and I got scared, so I just left." I saw that too. I saw that too. Aww. I no. <laughs> So the point of this, right, was all of these truckers were going to assemble in various points across the United States and drive west to east uh, until they arrived at your nation's capital, Washington DC, where they were going to blockade the city, make it totally unusable, in order to protest vaccine mandates. Now the vaccine mandates have all ended now, um, mm-hmm. so they were, they were going to do all of this in service of something that they had already gotten, um, and then they couldn't even do it. They just kind of it still hasn't ended on Amtrak or on planes or mm. in healthcare settings or in certain schools. What what I think is funniest about this is that since they've decided instead of going into DC proper, they're, they're just gonna the beltway. They're gonna circle the beltway and not really block traffic, which is what they've been doing. They're just driving around. Yeah, they're in gonna sort do of a tow line. off of yeah. uh, Washington DC. They're circum circumambulating it like the car. The, the the other thing is, you know, the only firms out there on the be- uh, the beltway are, you know, a bunch of a bunch of like government contractors and conservative lobbying firms. <laughs> yeah, so they're really, all- <laughs> they're, the only people they're irritating are the people who are in favor of their cause. They're all getting <laughs> blocked in by like CIA guys having to try to commute to work through all of these eighteen wheelers, which exactly. is just great. Uh, it I, sounds I, like I, we owe those three girls uh, a debt of gratitude. Absolutely, but I, w- I want them both to lose. You know, the CIA people who can't get to work, the people who uh, want to give everybody COVID and conjunctivitis in Washington D.C. I'm uh, gonna I'm I'm gonna protest the liberal establishment by blockading the exit that goes to the National Right to Work building. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yeah, I just I hope they stay tangled up on 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 the beltway forever, going around in yeah. circles and society progresses without them. About to say. Um it's just a hilariously ineffective protest against something that isn't real anymore. <laughs> hmm. This photo is very cool though. I mean it kind of looked like the Transformers went off the deep end. You kind of have like <laughs> It's a little bit Mad Max too, isn't it? You kind yeah. of want to yeah. see a guy with a, like a guitar on the roof of the the sleeper cab. Uh, I would yeah. love to see Optimus Prime with like an end all mandates <laughs> decal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Optimus Prime funny. is a QAnon guy now. Yeah. <laughs> another, another news about highways. One more uh, lane. One more lane. It's fine. It's, it's, we can we can in, handle it. This is incredible. Um. The I forget if it's Doug Ford or Rob Ford now. One um, of them. Yeah, I one mean... of those guys. One of the one who's not dead from crack. Mm. Um his um just a his, wild his, his, yeah, piece yeah. of Canadian political history that there were these two uh, these two brothers. Two who, like, brothers. <laughs> two brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and and, the, and they briefly ran uh, Ontario as their own kind of and personal they ran fiefdom. Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> in a world. In a, in a world where with two crack. brothers run Ontario with crack. <laughs> they decided that the Ontario 2051 Comprehensive Transportation Plan says they're going to widen the 401. Which is currently the world's widest highway, in order to uh, it's and this a is for all kinds of twenty-lane st- highway. It is an eighteen-lane highway. Uh, it's gonna be uh, twenty lanes. People, people in Texas will tell you the Katy Freeway is wider, but four, six of those lanes of the twenty-four lanes are on a frontage road, and I don't think that counts. Um, this is mm. monstrous. This is uh, atrocious to look at, and probably worse to be in. I hate everything about it. Well, yeah, because I don't understand how you could safely widen this road. 
right? Because you got four local lanes, you got five express lanes, you got four local lanes, you got five ex- uh, 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 five express lanes. Not in that order. I got that order wrong. Um, yeah, where where are the others gonna go? Once you get beyond like four lanes bunched up together, you get really diminishing returns because it gets so hard to drive in the inner lane because you have to go over all those other lanes. Well, this is this is also one of our best friends uh, on the show. Induced demand, right? Uh, yeah, you, you you build more highways, people drive on them, and they they get as congested as the lanes they were supposed to relieve the congestion on. Yeah, I mean so, that's my question, which is, what are you going to do in however many years' time when you're just going to do this again? Yeah, uh, yeah, Ontario has fallen to Highway 401. Well, it's it's yeah, all yeah, highway it now. All be, it'll all be one swath of Highway 401. Yeah, this is sort of <laughs> this is sort of like the outer beltway that goes around Toronto. Um, and this is kind of uh, it is the world's widest highway. It is extremely busy. I don't see a safe way to wide it other, other widen it other than like add a second deck with super express lanes. Which seems oh, hilariously cool. expensive. There's also a subway line that parallels this, which is unfunded. Um, yeah, just, just take the train. Yeah, just perfect. The train. Just perfect. They, they're, they're, that, 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 that line is not in the comprehensive plan. One of the reasons they want to do this is for climate resiliency, which I think is hilarious because this is climate arson right here. Mm. I mean, unless every single vehicle is electric by 2051, which it will not be. Um, <laughs> No, but like what during the water wars, you're gonna need to use this as a kind of like dry moat so that the city of Toronto can shoot raiders coming in from the outlands. And that's uh, you why mean, you need to widen it. Yeah, but you also have a nice smooth surface where the invading Russians can come in easily rather than uh, having to go yeah. through the mud where the Chinese should've, tires should pop. should have invaded <laughs> the GTA. Uh would have been much more successful. Would have worked much point. more to their advantage. That's a good point. You imagine the uh, the Ontario SSR, um, <laughs> <laughs> communism, eh? <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the Canadian forces uh, slightly fewer Ukrainian Nazis than the Ukrainian armed forces. Not that fewer though. <laughs> Speaking of Russia and Ukraine. We are the dumbest motherfuckers alive, oh my God. man. Yeah. The, the the Cardiff City Philharmonic, I think it is, cancelled uh, a production of Tchaikovsky because it was inappropriate at the current time. Uh, the Glasgow Film Festival uh, in my home city has uh, banned a couple of Russian films, not because of anything that's in them, but because they are Russian. Uh, we're also fucking banning Tolstoy, so cancel culture is real, but only in the most uh, like idiotic way, which is to just go. Actually, we think it's it's a bad idea to have any any Russian content at this time. Wasn't Tchaikovsky criticized for being insufficiently nationalist? Sure, sure. I mean, that he did make up right. for it by being insanely anti-Semitic, which uh, always gets you some points in Russia. Um, this is and true, gay. yes. And gay, yeah. Was he gay? Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. He was gay. He was gay as hell, oh. yeah. Ah. Oh, biographers have generally agreed that Tchaikovsky was homosexual. Look at that. There you go. It's a really bad time for anybody out there who is trying to sell a TV script, which is an adaptation of a famous Russian novel. Mm. So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a damn shame that all of these um, uh, artists and... Um, uh, uh, playwrights and um, authors of uh, Russian culture and literature uh, prove to all right of Vladimir Putin is great in the forward <laughs> and afterward of all of their works. Yeah, they yeah. predicted um, him. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and the thing about Tolstoy, impressive. the thing about yeah. Tolstoy is absolutely, insanely pro-war. Loved it. Couldn't get enough yeah. of it. He wrote yeah. that famous book, War. Yeah. <laughs> and nothing else. War and nothing else. War and nothing else. <laughs> yeah, there was, so, there was some, some talk that he was working on a sequel, but I don't think it ever panned out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it does yeah. go to highlight, like, part of the tragedy, obviously the main tragedy is, like, the lives that have been lost in the invasion of a oh, sovereign yeah. nation. But, like, but we it, can, we're only equipped to focus on the trivial shit, and this is the yeah, trivial shit. It's like, part of, part of the tragedy is, like, Russia is a, like, has so much to offer culturally, like, the architecture, yes. the music and stuff, it's beautiful, and it's a shame 
to see it reduced to a war machine by this kind of collaboration of of plutocrats and and petrochemical billionaires and fascists. Like it's a real it's a real yeah. shame, and it's it's a shame that stupid people play into this by people doing shit like this. People who should know better. Yeah, ex- that's that's exactly the thing that bothers me here is that like people like if you run an arts festival, if you're on a cinema festival in Glasgow, right? Wh- why do you need to go? Actually, I think Putin is basically right that Russia is this sort of like uh, warrior country, and therefore. Mm. We're not gonna. We're not gonna show fucking indie films from Russia. I was gonna say my my uh, my my PE teacher in high school was an ex Soviet Olympic athlete, and while she He's wasn't kicking, now. yeah, yeah, Northern Virginia well, is a hell of a place. <laughs> while, while she wasn't kicking our asses, um, she was always pushing like Russian literature and culture on us. It was great. <laughs> oh yeah, didn't you? Didn't you do Russian uh, at college? I, I did. I did. I. I Took Russian in college and in high school. Under His dad majored saying, in Russian. My dad did huh. major in Russian. Um, so yeah, both of us have to distance ourselves. I was about to say. Yeah, yeah I'm cancelled too now, unfortunately. Uh, we are yeah. brain supreme once again. The thing <laughs> yeah. is, like, it, it would have been so easy for like the conductor of the Cardiff City Orchestra to come out at the start and say, obviously, like we all condemn the horrible things that are being done in Ukraine right now. Tchaikovsky was a Russian composer. But like now more than ever is a time to remember the things that we have in common with the people of Russia rather than the government and like uh, many of whom are like scared and oppressed as well and like to enjoy cultural products like this from a more peaceful time in a spirit of love and unity like something like that it's not hard to write something like that it would have been better it would have been better to just do it and say nothing even that would have been a perfectly (laughs) reasonable someone goes wasn't Tchaikovsky Russian and then the card of Sydney just goes shit really it's just like what oh we thought he was French sorry about this I liked some of his overtures didn't know that he was Russian I'm following now I'm following now On the plus side, maybe we get Ayn Rand cancelled. No. <laughs> That's not how it works, and you know that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Man. Get Solzhenitsyn cancelled? Uh, Still no. <laughs> Again, not even for any of the good shit, just... Uh, get Vladimir yeah, uh, Nabokov cancelled? Oh, wait, no, never mind. That's already been done. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I don't have to hear anyone ever tell me about Lolita again, I will be a happy mm-hmm. man. Yeah, as I say, it's a bad time to be trying to sell a screenplay. Yeah, and the whole the whole world has become that one Call of Duty mission. No Russian, no Russian. Russian. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Ross, did you ever play Call of Duty? No. So stop stealing valor. I don't like. I don't like shooting people. Imagining you playing Call of Duty is very funny. I never found first person shooters to be very fun because I don't want to shoot people. Oh, I, on the other hand, love first-person shooters. Yeah, and you love calling people slurs, which is the I other do. important it's my aspect. Favorite thing the other do. important aspect, Before yes. we warmed up, I called you and Abby all sorts of unspeakable things. Oh, yeah, things. absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, when I, when I, you know what, I'm not even going to make the joke, because then I'm going to get censored. <laughs> I'm, not, yeah. I don't, I, I'm pre-bleeping myself. All right. That was the goddamn news. All right, we got to talk right. about computer. Hello, we got to talk about computers. Hello, oh, hello. Yes, this is the this is a image from the well. There's your problem back room where all the editing goes <laughs> on. <laughs> these, these are our editors. Um, <laughs> it's not just Roz drunk. Yeah. No, this is our this is our IBM fourteen oh one system. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so we got to talk about. I may have put too much effort into this segment. We have to talk about what is computer. Yeah, you badly distracted yourself learning what a computer was, yeah, and then forgot to ask what Y two K was. And I yeah. had to do the what Y two K is segment in the last ten minutes before we recorded. But that's fine. Uh, hey, hey. Is it salty <laughs> snail? <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. I thought it'd be fun. We start by looking at the history of this device that has ruined our lives. Mm. Um, yeah, it's what, hard what to, is a computer? What is a computer? What is a computer? It's it, it, it's it's a machine that thinks in sand that we've poisoned uh, and yes. arranged <laughs> in weird sigils, <laughs> um, and, and then it, like you do that often enough and in an advanced enough way, eventually you can play Call of Duty and get called slurs. Mm-hmm. Yes. It can only do two things, one or zero. But if you tell it to do lots of them in a special order, it can do more than two things. Mm. Yes. Um, so computation, you know, goes back a long time because people had to count things, right? And sometimes they had to determine relationships between things by using 
horror of horrors, math. Oh, <sighs> don't like that. Don't care yeah. for it. Yeah. So one of your what, earliest. What is this fucking dread sigil on the bottom right corner there? Oh, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Yeah. Um. So one of the earliest computing devices was the abacus, right? So it requires a lot of skill to use effectively, but essentially the position of the beads can tell you where various uh, can 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 um assist you in adding numbers very quickly, right? Some people are very good at it. Uh, they still teach it in like parts of Eastern Europe, in Japan, and parts of Eastern Russia. Um, you know, oh, it's canceled. 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 Yeah, canceled. It is canceled. No more this is this is in fact a Russian abacus, so definitely canceled. Double canceled. Yeah. <laughs> We can so, figure out exactly how cancelled it is using an abac. But not, <laughs> not <up>. this one. <laughs> yeah, um, so each row corresponds to like a number place, right? And you move the beads back and forth to compute quickly, right? I, I don't know very much about how to use these. Yeah, you can do um, the same thing with like knotted strands of rope, yeah. which is what they did in like most America. Um, Counting yeah. is hard, and it's especially hard, hard if you do it in your head, so it helps to have some kind of, like, aid memoir, and uh, everything sort of spirals from there, I'm afraid. What um, sort of things were people counting back in the day? Grain. Taxes. <laughs> Taxes. Mm. Taxes uh, on grain. Money. Mm -hmm. um, materials. Uh, you know, anything that need, needed to be counted. I mean, that's, that's a big question, that's the thing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and like days, and that leads you into sort of calendars. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Because um, I suppose all of this now is kind of done by computers, so I don't really think about when you've got to count shit. Um, if you had to do, for some reason, a more complex calculation, like addition, subtraction, division, uh, sometimes mathematicians could create something called a nomogram to aid in these calculations. What? This is sort of a paper calculator develop, uh, dedicated Fuck, to a single cool. equation, right? This one I stole from a guy named Chris Steaker, who has numerous videos on this subject, as well as early adding machines. Guys should be getting half a million views on each video because they're really good. They're well edited. They're witty. Um, you know, and all the things that we don't we don't bother to do. Exactly right. So I'm going to put a link to his channel in the description. But I stole this one from him. This is essentially a device for computing uh, polynomials, right? Mm -hmm. Which you can That's do simply by sick. picking. You pick one of the numbers, you, you lay a string over it uh, towards another number, and then the third number you get from the intersection. I forget exactly how to do it with this one, but he has a video on it. I'll link in the Intricate description. as hell. I really yeah. like it. Yeah. Dare wow. I ask what a polynomial is? Uh, I haven't done math um, since GCSE, which was uh, right. five years ago. So, well, we're gonna need this for the next slide. <laughs> it's a mathematical expression <laughs> involving yeah. a sum of numbers in one or more variables multiplied by coefficients. Oh, okay. It's yeah. None of that made any so, sense to me. I'm it's like a two x squared plus x plus yeah. Yeah. a constant. You know. Right, I mean, okay. I, I, I'm, be, I'm being a materialist about this. The reason why you need to count stuff is about is tax mostly uh, because you accumulate capital in a primitive sense. You get a lot of grain. You need to work out how much grain you take off of each person. Therefore, you need to work out like what a percentage of a certain a number is. Way to do yeah, it, yeah right, exactly. Sure. I Got can't it. believe okay. we're a real podcast. Yeah. Cool. So one of the first machines which was programmable, right? Um, well, first off, there were organs actually. Once you once you had like um, like the human brain. No, no, I was talking about uh, a pipe organ. Oh, because sometimes you could run part of that automatically. Sorry, what um, you, you do maths with a pipe organ? Uh, Did we not talk no, about but you can program it because you can put on you know like uh, the paper. Oh, because it's all uh, like valve work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you you can run a you can run like like a player piano, right? You know you, you oh. that's a program which is done through a reel of paper, right? Um, huh. Also, don't so forget the what is a anti program? The, the, what is the uh, anti theorem a program mechanism? is a set of instructions. Yeah, uh, where, where you you essentially you are moving things on the abacus, or you're like tracing things on the big nomograph or whatever. But it's just a set of instructions. Uh, so, I mean, in theory, you can like run a program on anything, like an organ or like yeah. a water clock or an abacus, or well, uh, this or this loom that we're looking or at. Or this loom. I mean, so this is a. This is one of the first programmable machines, right? The Jacquard loom, um, you know, in France in the 18th century, clothing with lots of fancy floral 
plant, fancy floral patterns was in style. This is really hard to weave manually, um, you know, on just an ordinary loom. This was also compounded by the fact that most of the individual heddles, which are the little hooks that raise and lower the threads for weaving those patterns, those are operated by child labor, which, you know, fucked up a lot because they're kids. Yeah, right? unreliable. Unreliable, yes. Yeah. So Joseph Marie Jacquard realized you could replace the children with punch cards. He put all those children out of work. Monster. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. But on the other hand, he greatly increased the reliability of the uh, loom. And right? your ability to get like cute floral patterns. So it's yes. impossible to say whether this was bad or not. Mm. But essentially the... The uh, the various the children patterns. came around and broke his legs. <laughs> like, Fuck you! <laughs> the first luddites, yeah. Uh, so Jacquard realized you could replace the children with punch cards, and the punch cards could block the heddles from being raised and lowered, depending on what the pattern on the um, on the uh, fabric was going to oh, be. Right? Clever. Yeah. So, same yeah. with same with an organ. Same with a music box. Same with a player piano. Yeah. Sometimes it's a metal cylinder, but you just use these perforations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in effect, these these punch cards are a program for you know the loom. Uh, you couldn't store a lot of data on them, of course. You needed a whole hell of a lot of punch cards for a complex pattern. So this, these these are like the first workers to be automated out of a job with these with these mm -hmm. children. Oh yeah. Um. So you might see the root of our problem already here, actually. Um. But uh, yeah, and, now we've got a whole bunch of unemployed children on our hands. Yes, yeah, <laughs> gonna be hanging uh, around, it, causing trouble, inventing, being teenagers, antisocial behavior. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a there's a show um, that was on. I forget where it came from. If it was from BBC, it was on PBS a long time though. It was called Connections by a guy named James Burke. He explains, you know, sort of history of computation through the loom, but sort of traces it back also to like Roman mills with camshafts. Um, mm. you know, he, 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 he does a really good job with that. Oh, one. Yeah, I, I might like, link that in the description. The, the thing is, there's this distinction, right, between just sort of additive, additive, additive and multiplicative machines, right, to yeah. uh, sort of timing based ones. And that's, that's what an organ is. That's what a, like, um, a water, like a water powered forge hammer, a trip hammer does. Is it just like rolls around on a wheel and that trips it to like drop down? Uh, same with this. Um, and this is, this will come up later once we start getting into the ones and zeros. Oh, yeah. Mm. So but just just bear in mind the idea that the Antikythera mechanism. Yes. I mean, yeah. We don't uh, have it in the slides. I I don't understand how it works. Uh, it it allowed you to play ancient Greek Halo. Uh, uh. I just wanted us to mention <laughs> it. God of War, yeah. surely. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. Um, but the the important thing for you to note down in your little notes here is that uh, th the timing of operations is something that is potentially very important. Uh, when you're when you're trying to execute a program, okay. Industrial capitalism comes right and leads to increasingly oh, complex no. societal oh. structures. Right, you know you got railroads, factories, multinational corporations, and needs for computation increase as well. Right, and this becomes yeah. sort of the era. Well, we have a picture where, of a computer uh, using yes, a typewriter. This is this is not a typewriter. This is an adding machine. Ah, excuse me. You have a picture yes. of a computer using an adding machine. This is when computer was a job, right? And not yeah, the, yeah this a, not woman a is a computer. Yeah. This woman uh, is yeah. a computer. computer. Yes. Yeah, she's been dronified. <laughs> <laughs> now, this guy, Charles Babbage, had an idea for a mechanical computer in the 1830s. He called it the difference engine. Well, this is sort Charles. Of, this is built <laughs> on uh, some earlier concepts for like... Um, I, I want to say it's called a pinwheel adder, which is a really, really simple adding machine where, you know, it has a mechanism to carry the one when you add over nine and you can have an arbitrary number of rows of that. Um, and, and, and Babbage realizes, well, you could add a lot more to it and have a much more complex machine, right? That could do a lot more than just addition or multiplication, right? And this came, uh, he's inspired by um, the fact that at this time, when you're navigating, you know, on the high seas, you need huge books with big charts and numbers about like where, 
where the stars are supposed to be is, for yeah. celestial navigation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, all of those books, they had to be published once a year because all these stars are drifting sli- slightly because the Earth's going around the galaxy, you know. Yep. Um, Farming uh, almanacs about uh, the length of days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, and they wouldn't have known why that was happening as well. They would have just been like, ah, oh, fuck, it's just, God God just makes it hard. <laughs> I just got to do this there, every year. There, there was some knowledge that the Earth was moving around the galaxy at that point just because you could take a look at all the stars and sort of figure out based on how they move, how far away they might be. I'm mm. not, I'm not exactly certain what the extent of knowledge was at that point. Um, but yeah, the, the big important book was the nautical almanac, right? Um, and this provided, you know, locations, of the stars, the sun, the moon, uh, at each hour at all locations on earth for a full year. Right. And you could and use I guess this- somebody somewhere <laughs> must still know how to do this in case the computer goes down. Like you must have to train somebody on the ship to be able to navigate. Yes. The US Navy uh, has they- started reintroducing celestial navigation in case the the ship systems get hacked. They, yes. they they trained Air Force navigators in celestial navigation into like the eighties at least. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, the US Naval Observatory still publishes a book like this, but I think it's you can get a physical copy, but it's mostly in electronic form. Um, but you could use this book and a sextant and you could figure out where the hell you were, right? Um, and the smart guys back at the observatory would devise some big complicated mathematical formulas for the locations of the stars this year and then send it to the computers, right? And the computers were, you know, guys or gals. I think back then, this is like early 1800s. They oh, were it's guys. guys then, yeah. yeah. And they had, to, they had to work on this, right? Every calculation was done twice by two different guys, and there were tens of thousands of these calculations. They were all very complicated. They required, like, you know, sines, cosines, logarithms, all that crap, right? Um, now, two of these guys got different answers. Then they, they knew one of them shot. did it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, there, weren't enough, there wasn't enough shot back then. You know, the, the, <laughs> Just the dropping, shot, dropping it off the pot with tower. sabers. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> To get bayoneted. I would not want to be not. dropped off the Baltimore shot tower. So if two guys got different answers, they'd have to do it again. Sometimes the two guys got the same answer, but the answer was wrong. Oh. And that made it into the book. <laughs> mm. Or more frequently, they got the right answer. And then when the, when the calculations went to typesetting, the typesetter got it wrong and it made it into the book. Oh, oh right. that's tough. <laughs> yeah, and this was very bad if you were a sailor and you needed that specific number, right? Mm. Now, Babbage, Babbage worked on these books, um, and he was frustrated at all the inaccuracies in the finished product, and he's like, all right, if only these calculations could be done by steam, right? Uh-huh. Like, again, mm. perfectly, perfectly normal guy. We yeah. put all those children out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> so he realized... Okay, if we sort of scale up these adding machines I can, that already exist, um, we could make something he called the difference engine, right? Um, you know, so this is a series of really big, you know, adding machines sort of in an array, and they interact with each other in a funny way, right? Um, you know, it, it could it it's it's very difficult to explain and, and, and how this works. But you can interlock them in ways yes. that allow them to essentially have a a computer memory. Uh, and if you arrange those in, in in the right way, you can set it to do different tasks. Oh, this one As, does not have memory. Excuse mm-hmm. me, I'm talking about the the analytical engine. The analytic like, engine, yes. The sequel. Yes. The sequel, the to, sequel this. to this. Yeah. Um, well, this this sort of. This machine worked on uh, two principles, right? The first of which is that most mathematical functions, like really complicated ones, you know, where, you know, X is some function of, or Y is some function of X or however it goes, right? Uh, It might have, you know, sines, cosines, logarithms, all kinds of stuff that's very difficult to calculate by hand, right? Um, You can approximate it to a pretty good degree of accuracy with a polynomial, right? Ah, if the sort of know, Kentucky windage of uh, of mathematics. Yeah, if you if you know a certain number of points on the line, you can um, make an educated a, guess. Approximate make, where the rest of the line is, presumably. Yeah, exactly. It's a Newton polynomial. If you have a series of known points and a complicated function, 
you can approximate it to a good degree of accuracy. But the higher order, the polynomial is like, you know, it's, I don't know, <coughs> X to the seventh or something like that. Uh, the more accurate you are, right? Hmm. Um, and you can do some more advanced stuff if you can figure out like the derivative at that point. But hey, it's too complicated to go in here. Yeah, especially yeah, working in metal <laughs> cylinders. Yes. I, d- I did maths at GCSE, which was only three years ago, and I can't remember any of this. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is polynomials can be solved very rapidly, entirely through addition. The guesswork. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's no, how you got that maths no, GCSE no, last year. No, yeah. that, that's, that's, that's a very slow way they teach you in Algebra 2 here in the United States, and it yeah, sucks. It does <laughs> suck. Can't confirm. It's really uh, stupid. <laughs> dude, I listen, man. Although, if it makes you feel better, I literally have a degree in this, and I'm still just like, what the fuck? All right. So this is called the method of finite differences, right? Um, so these very complicated Sounds polynomials. Like a tough blog post. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you do, all you have to do is you have to do a few points uh, on the polynomial equation by hand, right? And you tabulate the differences, right, in a big table until you get this chart right here, right? So this says this this x is here. The function is p of x is two x squared minus three x plus two. Um, and here, if x is zero, it's two. X is one, it's one. X is two, it's four. Three is eleven. So on and so forth. Right. Well, if you can get this first chart here, and this is this one is the difference. How do I explain this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you 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 you're struggling here, huh? This is x plus one, the function of x plus one minus the function of x. So essentially, it's this number minus this number. I, I'm right? fully and then you get a, you yeah, get a dude, negative I'm... one, right? Mm-hmm. And then if you do the difference between x plus one minus the different. The difference of x, okay, and it's that's so funny. I'm subtracting here from the next table, the next col, the next row and column. Uh huh. Th- I'm subtracting negative one from three. I get four. Now, yeah. once you hit the third row here, because this is a second order polynomial, on the third row, everything comes out to the same number. Holy shit, that, that's amazing. What that means is that by continuing this method downwards, right, rather than having to solve the equation, I'm solving a series of very simple uh, arithmetic problems, and I can extend that out to any arbitrary polynomial, right, and therefore I can do lots of very, very complicated math, <laughs> which is approximating some kind of very, 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 very complicated function just by doing addition. That's so fucking cool. That's like you've cheated. That's like you like did a backflip and like unequipped several items and you've just like managed to skip straight through maths. That's so good. You just yeah. like speed running maths. That's amazing. And just do algebra with a just calculator four. that like only has a plus and a minus button. It only has four. Exactly. That's, everything's four. I should yeah. remember this when I do my GCSE next year. <laughs> <laughs> everything is full that's so, the answer to everything yeah so the difference engine uses inputs based on this system to calculate large numbers of polynomials to a high degree of accuracy in a very short period of time because even when when the when the when the uh the computers who are the guys right were doing these charts they would use this method but they have to do it manually right um but uh, they're joining machine, the French children yeah. in the ranks mm-hmm. of people who have been unemployed yeah. by mm. automation. With this machine, instead of having to do all that manually, you just did a couple points, and then you well, crank you just the handle. Full. Yeah, you you crank the handle, and the numbers come out. Yeah, the whole, all the tabulations and star charts they print to them every year. It's just the number four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's four again. <laughs> You ever see that, that, that Rand Corporation publication, which is one million random numbers? 
Oh yeah, my favorite book. Uh, yeah, well, imagine that, but they all came out to four. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can't you can't falsify it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a perfectly random process. They just <laughs> happened to all come out as four. <laughs> <laughs> But this wasn't enough, because they had to build a sequel, they had to do a 2.0. Well, no, the biggest problem with this machine we'll get to in a second. Mm. Um, now, it was designed so that you also got rid of the typesetters in this process. It actually automatically imprinted onto a mold, which you could later fill with molten lead to get the typesetting. So now, now no, one could, uh, no one could fuck up the typesetting. Right. But also, no um, one could do the calculations anymore because they've all got brain damage from lead poisoning. Well, everything says <laughs> four. It comes, comes with the job. <laughs> Um, and this this could uh, do calculations to a very high degree of accuracy, uh, 31 digits, right? 31 wow. digits on a seventh order polynomial, right? Which is much, much higher than what the, uh, the book could do, right? And with a hand uh, crank, no less. Yes. Babbage hand explained crank. this concept. Hand crank. He, Babbage explained this concept. Uh, he built a tiny model of a portion of the machine to demonstrate it to the British government. The British government was really interested in it because these books were really expensive to produce. Right? The British government was like, that's so mm. funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Twirling a single strand of hair. Yeah. Now, the, main, the main issue with the machine, though, is Babbage, uh, Babbage didn't actually build it. Well, um, that will do it. Yeah, yeah. He, he sort of lost interest in it because he realized well, he could build. Well, Charles. <laughs> he had a better idea. He could build the analytical engine. Which was much bigger. Once again, uh, <laughs> perfection is always the enemy of the good to the hardware engineer. Mm -hmm. It's like, it no, I can do this better. I can do this perfect, in fact. It would be programmed the same way a jacquard loom was, right? You'd have a series of punch cards. Uh, the core of the machine was something called the arithmetic mill, which is essentially what we'd now call a central processing unit, a CPU. Fuck. Cool right. CPUs that again. The, yeah, that's the that, arithmetic mill? Yeah, Fuck the, yes, the, that rules. The arithmetic mill. Mm. Yeah. They could add, it could su subtract, it could divide, it could do square roots. It had mechanical memory for, you know, advanced programming, could store a thousand numbers of 40 digits for later use, you know. So this, this, this machine would be what we'd call, you know, Turing complete. It could uh, uh, calculate sort of almost any arbitrary set of instructions. Um, it would be the size of a locomotive with 25,000 moving parts and would be powered by a steam engine. That's right? so cool! He also inadvertently <laughs> invented the first computer programmer, his friend Ada Lovelace. Uh, oh, yes. Which mm. is a transgender woman ass name, as is fitting for the first computer programmer. Mm -hmm. uh, that does and sound she, about right. And <laughs> she 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 worked up some hypothetical programs for these, um, which worked as as was later was later discovered. No word on whether she had like some some jacquard loomed knee socks on in the process. <laughs> well, one of the one of the issues is there there have been uh, neither of these machines actually got built. Someone built a difference engine, but I think there's two replica difference engine that were constructed in full between 1989 and 2000. There's been some effort to build an analytical engine, but it's been stymied by the fact that no one understands uh, Babbage's diagrams or notes, and no one's ever managed <laughs> what, to fully- What the fuck is a cat go? Why is this- yeah, yeah. <laughs> He also has a, a, a series of volumes called his scribbles. Which was that really had, what it's good? That's fantastic. Yeah, which had a lot of details for the machines in there, but there's so many of them, no one's managed to digitize all of them, and let alone struggles. comprehend all of them. It's probably right? like Heidegger, and it's just full of a lot of racist shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of etches of, of cat girls. Yeah. <laughs> it would be very cool to just whip out an analytical mm. engine in your maths GCSE. It's like, well, you said I could use a calculator. You didn't say it had to be of yeah, a certain kind. It has kind. to be in a clear pencil case. Though, I used good a luck slide that rule in, in high school to be, uh, to be smart. Because mm. they won't let us use uh, graphing calculators, so I taught myself how to use a slide rule. Highly recommend it to piss off your math teacher who claims she's a doctor but won't show you the degree. <laughs> <laughs> show us the degree, Doctor Mrs. Mummert. <laughs> All I asked for was a degree, and she wouldn't show it to us. <laughs> show us the birth certificate. That's right. Um, in the meantime, these, these much more simple adding machines got more and more popular, right? And they got more sophisticated, they got more quicker to use, 
right? This is uh, sort of the golden age of the computer as a job, uh, really between like, I don't know, 1840s to like the 1910s, right? Um, this is when, you know, stuff like spreadsheets or physical objects, right? Uh, really complex computations that are trivial for a modern machine to handle were instead handled with armies of people, usually women, you know, they're doing calculations on paper. A lot of times they find the computer mach- indispensable. Yeah. <laughs> And th- and this this t- like takes on the shape of the states and vice versa. Like uh, yeah. th- things become more centralized, things become more statistical. Um, it, it like becomes more uh, more sort of numerate in these ways. Yeah, and you know one development really in- assisted here was the development of the relay, right? Um, so in 1840, Samuel Morse pa- uh, patented, patented the telegraph, right? And the primary element of this telegraph was something we now call a relay, right? You power an electromagnet, um, and two plates make contact, and uh, you know that completes a circuit, right? You use several of these, and you can make simple logic gates, right? You know, and or not. Yeah, and you then know. you're really off to the races because that's yeah. that's all you need. Like, well, it's not all you need because we can you can do it with simple addition, as we've seen. But once you have the ability to tell a computer this is an and function, this is an or function, right. this is a not function, you can do some very clever things with that. Mm-hmm. Like what? Uh, well, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, make a podcast. You can make a podcast <laughs> with it. You can yeah. play Call of Duty with it. Not that I would recommend either of those yeah. things. Absolutely. What, because once, then you can start writing like code and shit, right? You can start mm-hmm. being like, if this, then this. If this event this. happens, then this event happens. If this yeah. event and this event happens, and you know, be able to if trace going to back. crash, brackets don't. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's uh, the Tesla uh, pedestrian safety initiative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So. Once electricity becomes more ubiquitous, at least in office environments, adding machines could be powered, right? And simple relay logic could automate a lot of functions, right? So, you know, whereas before you were adding on the machine and you had to manually clear it, maybe now you could have a little electric motor controlled by simple relay logic that would clear the machine, or maybe it would be able to do multiplication now by doing the same calculation over and over again. You know, it, it got it, a lot of. A lot of these little adding machines got really, really sophisticated. They still weren't computers, though, right? Mm. Um, it's a big no, no, calculator. Because co- computers were pretty girls. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. They were computers, work on these. computers were the pretty girls who used the adding machines. Uh-huh. Mm. Um, <laughs> what? Now, this guy, Herman Hollerith, saw opportunity right here. Hollerith was the son of German immigrants graduate of the Columbia University School of Mines, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Mines is, is in digging in the ground or mines is in kaboom? Uh, mines is in digging in the ground. It's now the at, engineering at, school there. At, at, yeah, yeah, I was going to say at Columbia. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Pennsylvania and New York have... Just wasn't expecting Columbia to have a mining school. Mm. Now, in 1880... The U.S. Census was recorded on paper, ah, processed ah, on you paper. make my point for me yeah. about the, yeah. the computer and the state becoming as one. Yes, mm. it took eight years to tabulate, right? And everyone had to record the sex they were assigned at birth. That was the rules. <laughs> yes. Um, now, Hollerith had never heard of a Jacquard loom or an analytic engine, but he had ridden a train, and he had had his ticket punched. Just a perfect brotherhood of slightly autistic men yeah. who have like experienced <laughs> things in different Minor ways across the world. Yeah. 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 And it's like I could I could do this better. Yeah. Uh, conductor, when you receive a fare, punch in the presence of the passenger. Ah, oh, because they punched your ticket. Yeah. They punched Literally. your ticket. And railway and tickets the- had more information printed on them than just the fare and the destination, right? Because there'd be multiple conductors along the same route, they want to make sure you're the same guy, right? So you know that you you have punches for people's gender, rough age Uh-oh. range, their race. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. oh, right. don't don't worry. Worry. yeah. Bad. yeah. You don't yeah, want to know what the categories of race were. I'll tell you that. Oh my god, <laughs> just slur one, slur two, slur three, white. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's this uh, this Irish, this, Irish. <laughs> 
Italian. <laughs> uh, Italian's just under a category of swarthy. <laughs> um, so Maybe this is some so kind the, of Scottish. Yeah, this is so. This is so the the conductor knew the next conductor knew the person was the person they were supposed to be. Yeah, you this hadn't had your ticket stolen by some kind of Italian. This mm. practice lasted for a very long time. Uh, actually, Septa was still printing uh, a little gender sticker. On the uh, oh, trans passes. passes, yeah, the trans pass, ironically, ironically named. Enough. <laughs> they were still doing that until 2013. Um, Jesus, <laughs> yeah, we don't live in the most good city. Mm. Um, so Hollerith realized uh, data could be stored on punch cards, right? And you know, once he was in school, he realized the Jacquard loom existed. Machines could read them. This could, be applied. The balls, Roz. this could be applied <laughs> to the census. So you would record the census data on punch cards and have a machine tabulate the data, right? These are initially custom made cards with a special key punch that allowed census takers to accurately punch holes, right? Uh, so Hollerith- can I ask what you mean by, by tabulate? Because you said earlier on that it took eight years oh. to tabulate the data. What do you uh, mean just, tabulate? Just adding everything up so you get your final numbers and you get oh, okay. you know your various... Subdivisions and numbers. Yeah, um, percentage you know, of Irish. Percentage uh, of Irish in this district. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, so, so, in, so instead, you can do that on punch cards and then you can just like, and it'll do yeah, it. Yeah. You just shove it in the machine. And the machine does it all for you. Right. Ah. Um, so his tabulating machine company was an instant success. His machines were on the market by 1886, used by several public statistics taking organizations. Right. So these, these tabulating machines were simple. You know, you put the punch cards in, which have punched holes based on the data. Several spring-loaded wires were dropped on the card, right? And, and the- if you're a 19th century public authority, right, you, you, the desire for you to have data is there already, but the ease makes you desire it more. Mm-hmm. And uh, because you are a 19th century civil servant, you start thinking, man, I could record anything with this. I could record race. Oh, uh, yeah. Race. Uh, race? Race. Even race. race. Skull yeah. size. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Numbers of Irish. Mm-hmm. And don't Where forget, the... this eventually becomes IBM, famous for yes. not doing yeah. anything yeah. during World War II that was International bad. International business machines. Now, where the wires were blocked by the card, no data was recorded. But where there was a punch in the card, the wires plunged into an electrified pool of mercury. What? <laughs> yes, I've been working on the census for several years now, and it's making me feel very normal. Uh, I, let me tell yeah. you about the space Martians that yeah. I think are in my brain. And this, yeah, uh, that's not good. And this completed a circuit, right? And that recorded data. And killed one whoever of this, was tabulating it. Yes. One of this series of dials on the front of the machine. So these dials tell you how Irish the person you're looking at is. Yeah, well, you these, do your bigger th- tester, you assign your special points. Well, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. this this one might be total people, this one might be percentage Irish, this one might be percentage Italian, uh, <laughs> this one might be some some factor accounting for skull size. Um, uh, the, all, all of the rest of these are skull size. Mm. This one down here is average depth of horse shit per street. Um, <laughs> In a throwback to Charles Babbage, one of them is just four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a sanity check of the got four dollars and going to get four, really, then yeah. you have to check the yeah. machine. I'd, um, I'd be interested to know how these machines affected people's trust in the census and the census taking authority. Because at least with like a person, you can be like, oh, I understand that this person is like adding things up, even though I haven't checked the calculations, I understand how it works. But with this, it's like, well, God knows how this machine works. Like, if you didn't, I assume you didn't just tell everyone. Um, mm. But like, mm. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't trust it. You know, I, it says, it, it says it we're like, 60% Irish, but what if it's more, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think this, it, it, like you're predisposed to believe one way or the other about this. And I think a lot of, a lot of, uh, liberals or Whigs of the day are more likely yeah. to be like, oh, we're applying the infallible scientific method. Mm. Uh, oh yeah, this was adopted very enthusiastically by the census for 1890 because they didn't think they were going to get it done otherwise. Um, <laughs> yeah, somewhere Foucault is uh, is waiting to write a paper about this. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, then, then you once you once you've fed all the punch cards and you read the numbers off all the dials and you record those and then those can be 
integrated into the census in some other fashion, um, depending on, you know, whatever you get, you, 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 you record a huge amount of data very quickly. Um, but yeah, the, the U S census bought a whole shitload of these machines and they finished the 1890 census in six years. <laughs> okay, well, Worth it. Yeah, that's, that's an improvement. It is. Th- I mean, three years off is not bad. Yeah. So Hollerus company made a whole bunch of money. His machines got more sophisticated, automatic uh, feed, you know, card sorting, arithmetic operation. They more mercury. Do- mm-hmm. More mercury. They would print out specific statistics rather than have dials, right? Um, you know, you'd have control panels beep, beep, so you beep, could beep, switch beep, the machine beep, beep, between beep. different jobs. And in 1911, his company and three of his competitors amalgamated into the Computing Tabulating Recording Company, which in 1924 became International Business Machines. Yes, mm. big blue. Yeah. And that's, from that, we got the standard punch card, this IBM 80 row card. Ah, okay. That's what this yeah. is. Excuse me, 80 column card. That's the opposite of a row. Um, you know, and this, this is the definition of computing for about 50 years. You know, it's 80 columns with digits one through nine on each of them. There's a section up top for information uh, about the card the machine can read. The printed numbers don't necessarily mean exactly the printed numbers. You know, you could actually store a lot more data on these cards by just, you know, ignoring the numbers and putting stuff in in binary, right? But, um... Anyway. And you can store a ton of data about uh, race. Oh, race. Uh, well, the Nazis were fond of that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, IBM guys went out to install these uh, in certain locations in Germany and occupied Poland mm-hmm. um, in order to keep accurate records of. Uh, don't worry about it. They were just trying to check uh, Fanta consumption. Mm-hmm. They, they made a special version of the machine that automatically destroyed itself if you press a button. You mm-hmm. have to, yeah, probably have to run the card through like six or seven times to determine the exact tiny fraction of Jewish blood you had in you in order <laughs> to fig- go to the camps or not. Jesus. Like, it's definitely a complicated process there. But yeah. IBM facilitated it. Yeah, um, yeah. They facilitated a huge data management operation in the process of genocide. And they, to this day, I don't believe they've apologized. Huh. No, I uh, Lions Led by Donkeys, our sister show. If you're if you've never heard of this, well, I'm sure our smart ass listeners have. Uh and also like to bring it up every time someone brings up IBM. Uh definitely check out their episode on it. And along with Fanta, which was and developed we, we, by Coca-Cola yeah. Germany. And and yes. we see a culmination of my thing is like the person is reduced to a set of numbers in order to mm. eliminate facilitate the state. That's yes. very good, Alice. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Should get a history degree or something, maybe. What is your undergrad degree in? Law, and I didn't graduate. I dropped out to do this. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll go to university in eight years. <laughs> Shut the hell up. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. <laughs> Some of us are in our 30s, Abby. Oh, my God. So, I'm uh, 10. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. We're going to automate your labor out of the podcast. Uh, <laughs> So a big issue with punch cards is you need a lot of them to store uh, a lot of data, right? So here's here's a here's a bundle of punch cards. Recording, which is probably uh, one, don't worry about it. Yeah, mm. probably one program. You can see they wrote a diagonal line here, so you can easily sort them if you drop them. Oh, um, that is oh, clever! The nightmare of dropping your program into we, like a thousand sheets. We call them little Bobby tables. Yeah. <laughs> This was but a to common... literally drop tables. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, you're literally dropping the table. Yeah. Um, this was a common problem. Uh, my when when my granddad taught at Washington Lee in the early days, he had he had, as I've mentioned before, the most salt of the earth Appalachian job professor of economics at WNL. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, every once in a while, uh, some undergraduate would you know drop a set of punch cards. And lose all the data for their thesis. Oh, <laughs> oh. no. Because they hadn't if they hadn't marked it properly, it would be a pain in the ass to resort it. <laughs> yeah, just like using somebody's thesis as a coaster. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that would probably be fine. Um, because it doesn't matter what's printed on there, um, as long as the hole's intact, right? Oh, I yeah, I can see now looking close at the diagram, yeah. 
Yeah. But that's where the mercury goes in. Mm. Yes. Right. Hi, it's Justin. Uh, so this is a commercial for the podcast that you're already listening to. Uh, people are annoyed by these, so let me get to the point. We have this thing called Patreon, right? The deal is you give us two bucks a month, and we give you an extra episode once a month. Uh, sometimes it's a little inconsistent, but, you know, it's two bucks. You get what you pay for. Um, it also gets you our full back catalog of bonus episodes, so you can learn about exciting topics like guns, pickup trucks, or pickup trucks with guns on them. The money we raise through Patreon goes to making sure that the only ad you hear on this podcast is this one. Anyway, that's something to consider if you have two bucks to spare each month. Uh, join at patreon.com forward slash WTYP pod. Do it if you want. Or don't. It's your decision, and we respect that. Back to the show. So, so one of the things with punch cards is because they don't hand... Ha there's not too much data on each one. Uh, you wanted to try and conserve wherever possible. So you abbreviate it, right? Which is mm. very common for dates. You know. Uh oh. Yeah. Oh, I the think I see where we're going with that. Yeah. The general nomenclature for like a date went from like the March 11th of the year of our Lord, 1952, to like 3 slash 11 slash 52. Or if you wanted to get really aggressive, 07152, meaning it was the 71st day of 1952. <laughs> If you want it to be readable by absolutely nobody. Uh, well, mm -hmm. It's readable by the machine, though. Which also, is all we yeah. need. And this is where humans have to start thinking like machines in yes. order to get jobs. Yes. yes. Right. Uh, so if someone yells at me that it should be the 70th day, I would point out that 1952 was a leap year. Um, <laughs> get their Ooh. asses. Yes. But this saves space on the cards for other data. And... Over a large program or a large set of data, this could add up a lot, right? Um, and I mean, punch cards were very, very cheap. You get like a thousand of them for a dollar, but they were difficult to carry around. And again, if you drop yeah. them, you're having a bad plus, day. Plus <laughs> marginal improvement. And again, because I'm still thinking about totalizing institutions, you don't just use uh, codes for dates. You use codes for anything that you want to, well, encode yeah. about a person, which means that you have to categorize things and you mm -hmm. have to like have a, a useful little handy key printed out of what like, you know, group zero one, group zero two, group zero three means. Uh, but it's it's oh, it's Jehovah's very witnesses, Jews, exactly uh, gays. what I was yeah. getting at. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. you it's it's Political very prisoners? inflexible and it's very dehumanizing ah well yeah. it's perfect for literal fucking nazis then hmm. yeah it's kind of cool to be carrying around a, com a computer program and it's just like a stack of paper though. that's oh, cool. yeah. it's, it's, it's it's just a prick <laughs> <laughs> that's quite funny it's you can, just like, a big heavy brick <laughs> can i like, hide it in something toss it through your local starbucks window on, on the right here you have an act of sabotage yes um the the precursor to the black fax which is itself the precursor to the uh the ddos attack this is a lace card yes and um, a lace card is a fucking nightmare to a punch card computer if you if uh, the problem the, the thing about the lace card this is a card where every single potential uh hole is punched right which means um, the card has very little structural integrity now, so if you feed it into the punch card machine, it tends to just shred. Yeah, it eats it. <laughs> yeah, it, it jams it. up all of the like mechanical works of oh, your computer. Oh, that's so cool! <laughs> that's like, ha, you thought you had me beat, Yugi, but I planted my deck virus <laughs> into your deck <laughs> five turns ago! <laughs> that's so good! I mean, this kind of like mechanical like uh, weakness is also where we get a computer bug from. Is if you have a bunch of like uh, mechanical com uh, computation going on in a room, and a bug gets in there, it can like stick in the thing. Ah. So you can just like shuffle one of these into somebody's thesis and just fuck that whole shit up. Mm -hmm. Potentially, you fuck up everyone's thesis because mm. the machine would break. <laughs> <That's> so cool. <laughs> Hi, I'm Roz's grandfather. This is Jackass. <laughs> <laughs> 
But then we had to go and ruin all of this yeah, beautiful we, futurism by inventing electronics. It's a terrible idea. Transistor radios, yeah. you son of a whore. We yeah, diverge is, from the Fallout timeline onto this. Yeah, we wind up, uh, we wind up, um... So, alright, the thing about Relays is that, you know, they have moving parts, right? And that means they're a little, they're also big, right? So eventually we invent this thing called vacuum tubes that do the same thing in a smaller form factor, right? Um, and they, they're solid state. I don't know exactly how a vacuum tube works, but they do the same thing, right? As you know, punch cards? Uh, they're electrically activated as relays. switch. Yeah, as relays, uh, okay. yeah. Um, and this is when computers start getting boring. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just scrolling back up to remind myself what relays were again. Yeah. So, because all these relays, you know, they were big, they were bulky, they make a nice clicking noise, right? Which some people don't like the clicking noise. Um, I like the clicking noise. Yeah. No one tried to really create a general purpose computer. Um, now, there was this guy named Conrad Zeus who'd taken a whole Heck lot of, of a name. He'd taken a whole lot of money from the Nazis and created a relay based computer in 1935 that was. Almost, but not quite Turing Feeling complete. Feeling very normal. And then I built this electronic computer. <laughs> so instead no, of using it's cards... electromechanical. Okay. It's, it, these, yeah. these can still use cards, but in the way that they card, move... But, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the, the way that they move electricity across switches to connect circuits is yeah. they're using these vacuum tubes instead of a relay. Uh, and that's how oh, you do okay. your logic gates. That's how you do your ands yeah. and your ors and your nots. Right. is through these, these glass tubes. Yeah. Oh, and then they don't they don't have all the moving parts that make a noise. Got it. Okay. Yes. So so uh this guy Conrad Zeus made the Z3. Uh that was a relay based general uh computer, but there wasn't much call for one. So none very few other than that prototype were built, right? Mm. Um now World War II happens. Yeah, and you need to use a computer for things that aren't genocide. You need right. to use a Artillery. computer for things yeah. like fire control. You need to be able to go, I want to make a, an artillery shell land at such and such a point. Yes, Do the maths for there's me. There's a fundamental and difficult problem in ballistics, which is you know, the science of non-propelled objects moving through the air, which is this. How do you get the dumbest guys you know, <laughs> artillery guys, <laughs> to do some, yeah. to do some very advanced <laughs> who's, mathematics who's in a Royal Artillery Cadet Detachment, and you're so right. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Infantry. I know it's normally yeah. you guys, but I've met artillery men, and it's not you guys. <laughs> I, mean, I, I always thought you just kind of looked through a little telescope, and then you said they're over there, and you kind of you fire at them until you hit them. But I suppose that, do you have so to do that maths? used to be the for way, the but now you have to yes. do maths. Yeah. You had like uh, analog artillery computers for that purpose, right? Which is essentially close. it's a little it, it's like a, a <laughs> yeah a me fancy little device that was uh, you know you'd have some inputs that were in big block letters so you could read them, um, and uh, I, I don't understand much about how like. Artillery it's basically, aiming works. <laughs> oh, I mean, it, it, these kinds of things, they're a lot like nomograms. Uh, they're also yeah. a lot like the things that you use to, to mark uh, fires from a fire sighting tower. Uh, you just sort of like, you move a big wheel around, uh, like a slide rule, uh, and you, you kind of arrange things that way. And it's very, very fallible, particularly in something where you need to be precise, like uh, ballistics. Yes. Um, now, during World War II, we're of course making all these new weapons, and that means they need all new artillery charts so they can create these little nomograms and little analog calculators, right? And they need a machine that can make all this shit really, really quickly. Right? Um, That's what this is. This is what this is. This is I the find first a computer general... indispensable. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> yeah. This is the first general purpose electronic computer. The electronic numerical integrator and computer ENIAC at uh, the University of Pennsylvania in 1945. Right? <laughs> I'm, simply, I'm simply getting smugger as you tell me that the first general purpose computer was invented to help the state make war in a reliable yes. and industrialized fashion. At Penn, yeah. no less. At Penn, yeah. yeah. You sons of whores. <laughs> 
Well, the building where they built this is still uh, the engineering school main building. No, they never say. shut up about it, do they? Yeah, exactly. That's true. Um, I try to I run Todd on it. I hate that fucking school, man. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they, no, they it's fit. Doom, Abby. They get they they got to run Doom on it. That's the benchmark. <laughs> they uh they 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 finished this on like December tenth, nineteen forty five, just in time for the war to be almost over. Um, Perfect. Maybe, December tenth, nineteen forty five was after the war was over. Mm, Raz. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Maybe they were like, oh, we don't want to be, we don't want it to be used for war. We won't let them do that to you, Eniac. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eniac's like, I do no. not want to kill humans. Yeah, <laughs> University of Pennsylvania, well known as a lover of peace. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it was December 10th. It may have been a little bit earlier than that. First thing they used it for was um, to work on the atomic bomb project instead of D- artillery tables. Fucking modernity, <laughs> red and tooth and claw. Yeah. And Skynet ass shit. Mm-hmm. So it was uh, 100, th- it was 100, no, 1,000 times faster than electromechanical. Uh, adding machines, computing devices, IBM tabulating machines, so on and so forth. And it can be programmed to do anything, right? Essentially, any anything? program. Anything. Anything. Uh, anything. If you're willing uh, to wait long enough. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's still it's, trying to do E1M1 to this day. It's called yeah, I, edging. I, and it's I, think, fine. I think you could probably get it to display some ASCII porn if, <laughs> yes. if you were willing to wait. Like I, half an hour. I yeah, that's no yeah. trouble. I want and, and SNRIs, like, dude. <laughs> like 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 the uh, like the Colossus, like the bomb that they use at Bletchley Park. Mm. This is plugboard input. You yes. see in the background, like a synthesizer. You just have a load of little connectors, and you connect those up with cables uh, to get it yeah. to do what you want it to do. And this I takes guess. for fucking ever. Yeah, exactly. If you 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 can't program it through punch cards, you program it through you know switching cables around there were some what they called function tables which are really big panels that had 1200 10 way switches on them right um this process was very tedious it took weeks to do to set it up for one set of calculations um and the men didn't want to do it so the women did it mm. yeah, with also, women in programming uh very <laughs> very old tradition absolutely um, <laughs> also as we see from the caption of this the thing about vacuum tubes is they can just die very easily they yes. get no sort of signal that they've done this absolutely. which means that you have to if if your computer does not work if it doesn't want to cooperate with you in doing atomic bomb shit you have to go through all 19,000 of these fucking little tubes and check Woof. them individually God, that sounds like electrolysis <laughs> yeah, uh, I believe Eniac was also responsible for predicting the pr- uh, the presidential election of 1948, mm. and was able to give uh, I think an accurate prediction of Truman winning it. Hmm. What was I even weirder is that he that. did it in 1911. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you you this is this is um you know you could input data and punch cards in this machine but programming was very complicated the machine had a whopping 20 bytes of memory um it had 18,000 vacuum tubes 7200 crystal diodes 1500 relays 70,000 resistors 10,000 capacitors 5 million hand solder joints jesus <laughs> solder wow. battleship it weighed more than 30 short tons it's roughly eight feet tall, three feet deep, and a hundred feet long. Holy <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit! Occupied eighteen hundred square feet, and it consumed a hundred and fifty kilowatts of electricity. The power requirement led to the rumor that when the computer was switched on, the lights in Philadelphia dimmed. Jesus! Philadelphia's always like that. <laughs> Shut the oh hell up! <laughs> Wait, is that the one that you're from, or is that the other one? I forget. That's, that's where we are right now, yeah. Oh shit, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I meant that to be a compliment, <laughs> I, I, but I got it mixed up with the I, other one. I'll, t- I'll tell you what, I, I was coming home from my friend's house a couple of days ago, and I, I got a big roll-up door, right, which I can use to get into the back of my house, so I don't so have to go block to the front. it again? No, I, I, opened, I opened the roll-up door, and it got about halfway through, and then I put a, a transformer blue down the street, yeah, because they were uh, trying to use any act to print porn. Yeah, and then the whole the whole block blacked out for like three seconds, and then the power came back on, and I was like, "Shit, did I do that?" 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Must have done. Alice, yeah. you make that joke, but we are down the street from Penn. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's true, yeah. Um, so, yeah, ENIAC's your first general purpose computer. Um, proves very successful, does the job, but, you know, we, we invent something even better than vacuum tubes that make computers more boring, which uh, is the transistor. The transistor. Mm. It's yes. a little tiny relay, you can put it on a chip, and from yeah. then on, everything is silicon. We, yeah. we use the poison sand, uh, and everything gets smaller, way smaller, in fact. You know, you got mm. no moving parts, you don't have any wearing parts, really. Um, that is a very solid. cool invention, though. To go oh, from yeah, like, we've got a mechanical thing useful. that reads cards to like, we made it small and it never wears out. Yeah. Well, we, we, we put a bunch of like arsenic and some sand, and the result is that now you can do math without like any kind of mechanical interaction whatsoever. Yeah. We put arsenic and sand, and now we've destroyed democracy. Yep. Yes. Yep. Also that. Also that. So yeah, I use, uh, use a semiconductor to create a fully solid state switch, no moving parts, very tiny, very. Re- reliable your computers start to take recognizably modern forms this is an ibm 1401 system you see the big tape hard drives um, oh, i always thought those so were so cool. cool these are some like uh i think these are either punch card feeders or sorters over here um you know this is this is for like big business applications right these came out in the 1950s they could have up to a whopping 16,000 individual characters of memory, right? You could store 16,000 letters or numbers <laughs> in there for actual computing purposes. Obviously, storage was in these big tape drives, right? So again, uh, like abbreviations, well, space, you're trying to yeah, keep everything is, down. What, yeah. what you would use this for is indexing of paper files. So it tells you where to find a paper file that you need, rather mm-hmm. than storing any of the data on it. But that's oh, still okay. a huge efficiency gain. Yeah. Or, as we mentioned in um, our last episode on Penn Central, um, railroad car routing, um, yeah. railroad car tracking, uh, there was some uh, uh, passenger ticketing, which actually there were some pretty wild electromechanical systems for passenger ticketing uh, before uh, electronic computers. Um, but these, those were upgraded pretty quickly and then you know disregarded because we have no passenger trains in America. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, you can you can do a lot with sixteen thousand characters. It transpires. It's true. Yeah. Mm. Oh, my tweets would be unstoppably bad. <laughs> <laughs> but the drive is always to get more. You need more, and in order to do that, you need to start uh, like having more efficient methods of data storage. Things like things like magnetic tape is it's an improvement on punch cards. It's it's uh, got great data fidelity. It yes. archives very well. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it doesn't store a lot of data. That's why, like, you can't fit as much music on a cassette as you can on a CD, kind of thing. Um, okay. Yeah. And we and, we, we progress yeah. towards things like optical media based yes. on needing more space. So you know these these I don't know what the capacity of these tape drives are, but yeah, stuff does improve. So for instance, um, here is a. Five megabyte hard drive being loaded <laughs> into an airplane. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is uh this is in what, nineteen fifty six. This is an IBM three fifty hard disk drive. It has fifty twenty four inch uh platters, right? So twenty four discs or fifty twenty four inch discs. For that five megabytes of data. Incredible. Um, wow. Now, I mean, you've I, really I, got to want to look at that porn. <laughs> <laughs> now, all of your porn, on the other hand, yeah. is stored in uh, the photo on the bottom right. That is the, the sort of the culmination of my point about uh, data and the state and storage. Yeah. This is the Utah Data Center. It was built for the uh, the NSA. Uh, amongst others, and it's sort of a central data holding facility, one of several, but I, I believe the largest that the US government runs, and it facilitates a lot of mass data collection, because if you intercept a lot of phone calls, and you read a lot of emails, and things of this nature, you need to p- fucking put that shit somewhere, and this is, the, this is where they put all of it. 
Um, it, it's so what you're telling enormous... me is we can just take out that building and... Uh, good luck trying. I think if you like take two steps towards this thing, you get sawn in half. It's like, all of this is filled with racks and racks of servers for data storage. It's an enormous environmental draw, uses huge, huge amounts of water, um, uh, power for like cooling all of this shit. Um, and it, it's just sort of the the apotheosis, right, of big data is that you can store all of this shit like this. But there's there's another thing that I want to talk about, which is that like obviously storing huge amounts of data takes a lot of space still. Um it, and while we've gotten much better at it, it's still a problem. Data storage is one thing, data transport is another. Uh we're really bad at transferring data. Um, and so what you have on the top right here is an Amazon Web Services snowmobile. Uh, and this is this is a, a tractor trailer, a semi truck, uh, which contains I think it's like exabytes worth of data. If What's you need this? to, uh, it's the snowmobile. It's Amazon Web Services big oh, truck. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah, will yeah. Send the thing is fucking wild. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they will send this to you with an armed escort, and not a kind of like joke armed escort. The kind of like snow crash kind of corporate armed escort. And if you need to transport a lot of data securely, this is more efficient to physically put it on a truck like it's on pallets than it is to try and move it. Uh, even something like, so much shit gets moved through the US mail, through people carrying like even like uh, SD cards or hard drives, uh, which is called Sneakernet, charmingly. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's this, like, it's still an unsolved problem of data transfer. And so these two things, the fact that data takes a lot of space and a lot of resources to store, and the fact that it's very difficult to transport, mean that you want to abbreviate still as much as possible. That's why you want to collect metadata, it's why you want to, like, categorize, it's why you want to abbreviate. So inside that truck, just so I can picture it, there's mm -hmm. like a hard drive or a laptop? It's or hundreds, yeah. hundreds of thousands of them. Oh, big, right. big. Think, think of like massive server racks that run down the whole length of that in like a climate controlled environment. That's a hundred um, petabytes uh, per snowmobile. I like mm -hmm. And uh, a petabyte is a thousand terabytes. Wow. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I mean, even to be able to access that data, you'd need like the fucking enterprise. Like right. mm -hmm. for reference, I have a fifty-three. Well, with redundancy, fifty-three point six terabyte server. Okay, wow. I doubt, yeah, good I for doubt. you, Liam. Thank you. Yeah. I, you. You have the login to it, uh, and it has taken me, Abby, uh, years and years and years to collect that much data. But it's the same. It's, it's the same as the right. Ontario highways. Because what you do is you induce demand. The more data you collect, the more you want to use it, and the more you want to use it, the more data you collect. Really until until you end up with the Utah data center, until you end up just collecting everything that's of, of very little value to you potentially because hey, you maybe leave you my can flak mine backups it. alone. <laughs> Just running up to that truck and putting a lace card in it, like, ha-ha! <laughs> I just want to comment on this tractor trailer. They made it all white in an attempt to be discreet, like, oh, this it's, is an ordinary it's the least, snowmobile. It's, it's the least discreet thing. It's it's up there with the safeguard transporter that they, the fucking, the NNSA moves nuclear weapons in. It's, it, it says to me there is a highly like laden down black suburban with tinted windows in front of and behind this truck. It's... Well, I mean, you can just look and see, oh, third axle. Something's <laughs> up with this. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is uh, because you're, you're doing economies of scale, which is super important to this, uh, I'm looking at how much snowmobile, like the snowmobile pricing details, and it's 0 0.005. Uh, dollars uh, for a gig per month, but I assume you have to be storing like petabytes. If, the, if of there's stuff. no minimum, we could badly irritate Amazon Web Services. Send me this truck so I can toss a one external hard drive in the back of it. Actually, I want you to host my super illegal uh, <laughs> <laughs> Plex my, server. I, I yeah, also all like of my this, music um, pirated. This this highly secure data facility where they'll shoot you on site if you approach it, is um, built out of tilt-up concrete, which is going to get mm -hmm. knocked over in a stiff wind. 
Oh yeah, um, but also, uh, we can also talk wins. about Iron Mountain in Pennsylvania, <laughs> oh, yeah. which is built into literally Iron Mountain, a mountain I'm, in Pennsylvania. I'm just wondering, how do you become an armed god for Amazon? Like, where's the recruiting service that gets you that? It's job? easy, Abby. Your your coworkers say, "Hey, maybe we should unionize." And what you do is you take a shift to them. <laughs> and say, Daddy Bezos, right. save me. No, what you want to do is you want to you want to get out of the U.S. military at a like a a junior officer E4. or senior enlisted yeah. rank. <laughs> yeah, E4. you want to get out of the U.S. military and go to a clearance, uh, a security clearance job fair where all of these guys will try to recruit you for secret shit. Uh. Um, next slide, please. Oh well, I was just gonna comment on this mm. this this five megabyte drive. It's not just big because data storage was inefficient. You could easily store this in a tape drive at the time. You know, something that was more the size of a cabinet than a, you know, five ton pallet thing. Right. Um, but I this really appreciate was, your this weird was, obsession with tape drives. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. They're cool. Uh, but this is, this is a hard, this is one of the earliest hard disks where you could access any kind of information, any kind of in, any information anywhere on the hard drive instantly rather than having to wait for the tape to scroll to where it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's, one of your, mm -hmm. that's one of your advantages to this uh, a hard disk over tape drive, because tape drive, you have to... You, gotta also, you, you just have to rewind also, also or now more obsolete to the technology. Yeah. Don't at yeah. me. No, it's get, not. get an no, SSD. It's not. Uh, no, it's uh, not. Next slide. No, it's next slide. Not. Next slide. Gotcha. Be kind. And, we rewind. You're, an, well, you're an hour doing, and a half in, and we get to the culprit of, of 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 our problem here. You're not doing enterprise scale shit, Alice. Unless this I'm sorely mistaken. This is an RTC. It's a real time clock. It's a little chip that you put into a computer because sometimes a computer needs to know what time it is. And there are two, basically, two ways of figuring out what time it is for a computer like on a hardware side. One is you have a little quartz clock in there. The other is that you just fucking read it off the mains electricity with some very clever electrical engineering. Ooh. Um, and remember what I said about how timing makes a, makes a significant difference in a lot of applications? Not just things like where you need to know exact timing, like say, train timetables, but also things where you need to know what you've computed when, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot that depends on these. And so every computer will have one of these in it, just as a fact of life. Um, and what it's actually intended to do, the priority of displaying you what time it is, that's way low down there. Mm -hmm. Measuring things like uh, how long it's been since you last powered the computer, even while it's off, for instance. That's something that this needs to do. It needs to do a bunch of shit. Um, and so they're in everything. Um, this will be a problem. Next slide, please. But we don't know when exactly, because they're all broken. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, join me, Mr. Charpo, in the yeah. MasterCard Y2K Command Center. I was going to say, you know, one, one of the, I, we went through all this computer history, and it's kind of like, why are we talking about all the old timey shit when we're talking about a problem that, you know, it, it starts at the end of history, yeah, you know, this the late type 90s, of office, right? Yeah, when this everything type, was fine. Yeah. This, is like, uh, this is like the Salvador Allende um uh cyber, uh, cyber sin. sin but for capitalism yeah yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and there's there's, um, there's two reasons why one is international finance yes um we accidentally computerized it we we turned a bunch of guys making bets on a chalkboard in a coffee house yeah. into oh, the way that we organize right python yes, we, yeah. we 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 accidentally made that the way that we allocate resources for some reason and mm. we we required them to be able to do this and make those bets several hundred times a second. Um, so it, it, it therefore finance just computerized everything, and everything was computerized by finance in a way that required a lot of very precise timing. Um, even just to I prevent like fraud. Fashion phones, though they are cool. Oh yeah, they're nice. Like mm. e More even just if like. Someone steals your card, right, and takes some money out on an as an ATM. You will have a timestamp of that exactly because the ATM will have a little RTC in it that tells it what time it is, and they'll be able to pull the camera footage of that. That's that's a concern too. So that's one reason. That's finance. The other reason is just sort of entropy, I guess. Legacy systems, yeah, lots of shit. 
was yeah. still running with punch cards and these old timey, you know, embedded computers, because lots of like big industrial processes or have machines that run for 30, 40 years or more. Right. Um, you know, and stuff that's designed really be, only for that function. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, I, I don't know, you're in a steel mill, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. and you have like uh, uh, some kind of like I, maybe maybe the the ladle that dumps the molten steel into the crucible or whatever, you know, has like a IBM machine attached to it that was designed in 1956, which is the last time you modernized that steel mill because it's incredibly expensive to do so. Right. And now the dates aren't going to work. Yeah. Because every single the year one of 2000. these things has a little RTC in there mm -hmm. ticking away. And it's ticky away but because everything is abbreviated. You want to use a shorter date format as possible. And the shortest way to write a date is with in a year is two digits. You use the Ooh. last two digits. Loads mm -hmm. of stuff was punch card operated well after you might expect, like up until like the 80s, the 90s, right? Oh, especially sure. the 90s are relevant here. Um, mm. You know, especially, again, heavy industrial processes where you don't want to replace the machinery so often because it's all like one off custom made shit, which is incredibly expensive. And so, so <laughs> the computer knows like 1991, what? Well, because it knows 91, mm -hmm. 92, 93. When you get to 2000, 00, zero it can't tell the difference between 2000 and 1900. Yes. Exactly. Yes. That's so it's going to be like, we've There's all gone back problem. in time. Ooh. Now it's, yeah. we're doing computations <laughs> in the year 1900. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I can sexually harass other computers now. <laughs> And as as Howdy. people start to realize, I remember that, it, there's that line from Futurama where Bender's like, "Are you familiar with the old robot saying does not compute?" <laughs> <laughs> well, as people start to realize that every computer knows what year it is, and actually weirdly depends on what year it is for a lot of things, people start to get worried, and then they start to get more worried, and then they start to next slide, please. Uh, I was gonna another anecdote. I. Coincidentally, oh, hit me, hit me the anecdote. coincidentally, um, so these, these legacy computer systems kind of keep like an uh, old timey computer business afloat even today. Right. So like, mm. I remember there was a uh, near where I lived coincidentally, uh, very close to where the Capitol beltway, uh, truck convoy is now blockading the right to work building. There was, uh, <laughs> there was like a computer recycler and reseller. That you know, as of 2011, was still selling computers from like the 1980s. Their biggest NASA customer had to go on eBay to get uh, an 8-bit uh, Pentium chip. Yeah, their biggest customer, I think, was a, a a a dairy processor across the street. Sure, it was because yeah, because because <laughs> their their systems all ran on shit from like the, the 80s, and if anything broke, they had to go across the street to the used computer store to get it because it would be too expensive and complicated to upgrade the computer system. Organizations um, just have this sort of like entropic feature. It's the same way that like Mossad is able to just destroy a bunch of centrifuges in Iran because they're all hooked to like Philips SCADA systems. And like once those are compromised, what are you going to do? Change them all out? Of course you are. Siemens systems, actually. That's what Stuxnet targeted. Excu That's excuse me. Anyway, sorry. I don't, I, I, I don't mean to insult the, the, the brave the hackers of, of, of the NSA and Mossad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so everybody well, Mossad, became. Going after a German company, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, that, that instead of working with them, yeah, it's. Uh... But people became very worried. And uh, next slide, please. In the febrile atmosphere of the 1990s, because a lot of people think that oh, it was just the end of history. No, the end of history was an elite opinion for elites. Yes. Normal people and abnormal people, for that matter, during the Clinton years, were going completely fucking insane. As NAFTA started to bite, uh, you had the birth of the militia movement, which we'll get into. You had a lot of millenarian uh, symbolism because Americans, ever since well, ever, in particular, have loved a symbolic date. You guys love that shit. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, people are like, Jesus is coming back on, it, on you know, December 31st. Yeah. And the f a new millennium, like the year 2000, is a frightening, frightening prospect, just sort of numerically, if you've lived your whole life in the 20th century, yeah, you're going to be in a new one. It feels like a demarcation point. I thought this was going to be the fourth Great Awakening when the fourth Great Awakening was actually QAnon. 
Um, <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't go back. Take, go gonna back. Ta- going to take another 20 years, guys. <laughs> <laughs> now, th- this, this, had been, this had been known, right? Like, everybody, and it, like, computer programmers kind of knew that this would be a problem. But it, it like, it didn't become a mass hysteria until, a, like, they started warning about it in public because of, again, financial systems. Uh, because you have bonds that are going to mature in yeah. 2000, and everybody's like, oh, this this 100-year bond is now a 200-year bond, or whatever. Um, well, I was, so, the, the financial industry was well ahead of everyone else in, like, fixing Y2K issues, just because they, they found an issue where you know, these bonds had to be issued and the data had to correspond to it. Um, now, I don't know how that affected bonds, which had been imported into the system earlier, but yeah. But you also have this kind of creeping terror of people who are aware that everything has a computer in it now, had no real say in this, feel very, uh, very alienated mm. from it, and don't understand it, are frightened of it, and therefore think everything has a computer in it, Everything that has a computer in it is going to fail. And so on the 1st of January 2000, uh, there will be no electricity anymore because the power plants will have computers in them. All of the prison gates will open because they have computers in them. There will be terrorist attacks because terrorists have computers in them. And there will be (laughs) wild dog packs because wild dogs have computers in them. Not Mm -hmm. domestic dogs, though, which is confusing to me. No, that's what happens when they get spayed or neutered. Uh, and I, I I remember uh, I remember the thirty first of December nineteen ninety nine when I was uh, minus two years old, um, but I, I, I do I do remember the stroke of midnight. And I was I was at a big party at the time. Um, I, I was very very young then, but I do remember it. And I remember there was like a good like ten or fifteen seconds after the stroke of midnight when everyone was just like, oh, mm-hmm. oh. Uh, oh. no, nope. I mean the speaker plane. still works, so hey, everyone all right? Yeah, okay, let's yeah. go. <laughs> I mean, so there you, was you, there was like a real tension. Yeah. You you see some more of this fear of technology. Uh, a lot of a lot of the evangelicals, in particular, were very very frightened of barcodes when oh, those yeah. became adopted yep, yep. universally oh, yeah. as yeah. as the mark of uh, as the mark of the beast. Are you still another, see that with the five G shit? Another because railroad the, invention, the, the, right the barcodes there. Barcodes have like six 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 hidden in them. Mm-hmm. Oh, classic times. And it's like no, it's it's like sublimated anxiety because now all of this stuff has this has this like symbolism on it that you don't understand why it's there, and no one mm. consulted you. It's just it's just been imposed it's just on there. you, right? Yeah. And There's a really the good book the- called The End of Money that mm. touches on. I highly recommend. It. It's a bit technocratically weird, but. You know, it, there's a whole section about this evangelical guy who basically refuses to use credit cards because he believes, you know, they're the devil or whatever. And it's just really interesting it's to true. watch. It, Not in the way true. he thinks, but it's true. <laughs> no, it's true, man. That's right. Can confirm. The, the Omen films came out, and they were like, the Antichrist is going to come, and it's going to be a mm. charismatic person with the surname of Thorne who has like political and entertainment <laughs> connections. I mean, that's just wow. ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, uh-huh. next, next slide, please, because I have I have this photo that I found at the last minute, which I I love a lot. This is a family in Colorado with their Y two K supplies, and I think this says much much more than it, it it was meant to at the time, right? I think this this speaks to a kind of terror. I mean, the nineties were this place where like there was this pendulum, right? The right the right wing in America exists on a pendulum between uh we love our cops, we love our law enforcement, and where it was in the nineties, which is the president of the NRA calling the ATF jackbooted stormtroopers. <laughs> um and th- this was this was the far end of like right wing distrust of the federal government in particular. And so a lot of these people went into militias, uh, the consequences of which are still being felt to this day, and a lot of people started prepping. And I feel like this was, like, obviously it existed because of nuclear war before this, and even before that, but this was prepping's big cultural moment, yeah. was that there would yep. be a defined moment when the shit would hit the fan, you could no longer rely on the government or anybody else, and there would be others outside waiting to take your bucket full of food, and you would have to shoot them in order to keep us. In order to defend your, I'm zooming in here, rice a and bag of raisins. <laughs> <laughs> These people have always fantasized themselves to be sort of the, you know, in the event of, it's like the same reason, the same way gold is positioned, even though like 
when the apocalypse comes, how much useful is your gold going to be? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a comically gold. small amount of firewood. Yeah, I was thinking that. It's, I mean, not, I guess of, it's, it's not a lot of firewood. It's not a lot of food either. Um, I guess yeah. there's, a, there's a bigger pile back here. But yeah, this is all generally a comically small amount of everything. I think this is a, a neat little window into the American, the white American psyche here. Oh, please and don't. let's not overlook that t-shirt, the boy on the left, that says let's Jesus not. is life. Jesus is life. Mm-hmm. No, no, he's no, actually what, dead, that's the whole point. <laughs> what about this pickup truck, though? Ah, oh, I yeah. mean, back yeah. before the pickup trucks got big, so it's yeah. not a tank, but... Yeah, it's, it's small, but it still looks like it's got an eight-foot bed, though. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Spiritually, it has a gun rack. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's what's in the job box. Yeah, maybe. Um. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm thinking about this image. I'm going to be thinking about it for a while. But of mm-hmm. course, uh, as as we know, uh, and I, I used my favorite book cover in recent times as the next slide. As we know, nothing happened. Uh, no, well, no, I, I think there were a few things that went wrong. Couple weren't there? things happened. Um, because hmm. there were at least two Japanese nuclear power plants where a couple safety systems failed. Not critical ones, though. They got confused. U.S. Naval Observatory that day said, um, uh, uh reported the date as 1900. Um, <laughs> That's quite cute, that was, that was, a, that was a fairly common uh, error, actually. <laughs> we should change it over. to that. We should have just done that. <laughs> no, we're not doing the 21st century. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's now 1922. Yes. Oh, now. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I think there was an incident in the UK where uh, a bunch of medical tests were sent out to pregnant mothers, um, informing them of the risk of Down syndrome in their children. And because of the date change, they were all wrong. So a bunch of healthy babies got aborted, and Ooh. a bunch of kids with Down syndrome who would have been aborted otherwise were born. Oh, shit. Um, yeah. Wow. Y two K had a body count after mm-hmm. all. This is true. Wow. Uh, so it is a problem. There is your problem. Uh, it depends on how you define abortion. Uh, oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> but- <laughs> But what didn't happen were wild dog packs roaming the streets, as no, far as I know. They were all uh, domesticated dog packs. Exactly, exactly. Planes didn't drop from the sky. Um, and as well, a consequence any of this... Wasn't in the early 2000s at all? <laughs> yeah. No, thankfully. <laughs> and, and so as a consequence, people learned a lesson from this, which is... Um, Everything is fake, actually, and you shouldn't ever be worried about anything, because it's gonna work out. Nothing actually um, happens. Yeah. yeah, and it, it, there's this kind of thing, right? Where like a lot of programmers and a lot of a lot of hardware developers spent many many years working on this. Uh, it cost something like four hundred billion dollars because what they were doing was going in and replacing all of these little RTC chips in things that uh, had like would otherwise have had obsolete ones. Oh, really? They um, just did it. They just did it by hand. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes so it literally cool. was just changing out a part. Um, hmm. But because that's like uninspirational, and because it's nerdy, and because it takes a long time, and it doesn't like make for good media, because it's all done of, by women. It, well, also <laughs> yes, uh, it, it, this was like totally unremembered. Um, even very very quickly afterwards, I think the consensus about Y two K was that it was a joke. Um, that's certainly the, how I remember it culturally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Is that like, oh, uh, the nerds warned us about this thing, and then nothing happened. Yeah, um, we, we didn't listen to the nerds the same way we didn't listen to the hippies, who mm. turned out to be completely <laughs> right. And this is, I, I mark this up as a rare sort of dub for mankind, a rare, a rare entry in the wind column alongside the hole in the ozone layer and acid rain, where, like, in some ways, those easy, and I'm doing big air quotes, those easy wins really fucked us in the long term, because we thought, ah, well, it's it's fine then, clearly. We don't have to worry about any of this other shit, because someone's going to take care of it, and mm. it's probably not even a problem in the first place. Um, and I mean, clearly this was a case of hysteria, right? Like, a lot of this was blown wildly out of proportion. Wild dog packs were not going to roam the streets and eat you. Yeah. Mm. I mean, but, if, if the if the plane lost navigation, you could always take out the sextant and, and the big almanac <laughs> and yeah. figure out where you are. And yeah. Oh, it's four. Ah, oh, yeah. It's four. It was <laughs> four, four all along. <laughs> but 
there was a real problem here, and it did take effort to fix, and it was fixed like largely because of the sort of self-preservation instincts of capital. Um, and w we we learned nothing <laughs> from this <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah, learned nothing. We uh, uh, well, I mean, that's not true. I'll, I'll say this right. Uh, we, we learned. Next slide, please. We learned not to use a legacy system just for the sake of it being a legacy system, because we don't know how to upgrade it. Incidentally, this is a, a floppy disk that controls ICBM launches. Uh, th those were only... Is that <laughs> Sorry, what? Is that an 8-inch floppy? That is an 8-inch yeah. floppy disk, yeah. oh as used God. by the Strategic <laughs> Air Command. Uh, the, they used these until 2019 as command and control for nuclear weapons systems. Oh, now some I mean, guy from 4chan can just hack into it because it's connected to the internet. Great. <laughs> I don't know. I trust the 8-inch floppy. <laughs> Estradio will do that to you. <laughs> and next slide, please. We learned a lot about putting computers in things for no reason. Uh, we stopped doing that, and now things are only online. I've never things heard are only of the networks. Internet of Things. Yeah, oh my God. for when they, when they have a good practical reason, please ignore this photo of a Weber grill that on Thanksgiving needed a, a software update. There was a. a I, I find saw the future is so goddamn stupid. Indispensable. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, best of all, next there, slide, there please. There was an article on Billy Penn today. Mm. Um, Oh, the, about, the, the Bitcoin house. The Bitcoin mining house, yes, that oh. someone's selling uh, up on like 42nd Street. Um, <laughs> they're like, oh, you, can, you have a Bitcoin miner implanted in your house already. It's also God. connected to Internet of Things, which all your appliances are. I'm like, I don't know. This is somehow going to cause my oven to eat me if I have <laughs> something like that. Yeah, pa know? The packs of wild no. dogs are real now. Yes. Um, you know, and the, of course, the washing machine is going to walk its way across the house and block me in my bedroom and then catch fire. <laughs> Feed me. <laughs> Feed me. No, it's going to go to the washing fold across the street, be with its brethren. <laughs> and of course, we also learned uh, not to worry too much about apocalyptic dates. And we have here a, a headline from The Guardian saying, Is the year 2038 problem? the new Y2K bug, and proclaiming that it's going to cause computerized doom. And that it's uh, somehow the fault of trans women. Absolutely. Yes. Congratulations. I mean, the year 2038 thing is even funnier because it exists by virtue of Unix systems having this kind of French Revolution calendar, whereby they count up in seconds from midnight, 1st of January 1970. Uh -huh. It's the epoch, yes. And it's uh, it's a thirty two bit number, and uh, in sometime in twenty thirty eight, it will become larger than a thirty two bit number. The question is, can you can you um, replace all of these thirty two bit systems in time? Because a lot of a lot of systems now count up with um, sixty four bits. In which case, you do have to worry about the year two hundred and ninety two billion problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um I I think we can we may have some time to fix that one. I will a, say a, that. A little a little best buy sticker that says please remember to turn off your computer before midnight on twelve thirty one two hundred and ninety two billion nineteen seventy. <laughs> <laughs> Put that in a little sci fi video game as an Easter egg, that'd be great. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be that date. Because the Gregorian calendar gets a little shoogly at those uh, mm -hmm. at that, oh, that time. No. Yeah, Wait, yeah, what? it's it's not that <laughs> precise. <laughs> yeah, shoogly. <laughs> yeah, shoogly. Wait, are you telling me that? Is the calendar going to run out? Are we going to run out of dates? No, what's going to happen is the the leap seconds are going to count. Yeah, the leap oh, seconds. You got the leap seconds because you got the leap. The leap, everything's an approximation because yeah. the year is not three hundred and sixty-five days. It's three hundred sixty-five days, six hours, and change. And mm -hmm. and you know so the, the current thing is you know you if no like, one updates the calendar in the next two hundred and ninety two billion years it's going to be really bad for your computer exactly right um, right so, so what have we learned about Y two K here go back hey, actually go back to vacuum tubes that's another thing nice, that most computers didn't sound. have programmed into them or some of the nuances of the Gregorian calendar such as yeah. that years divided dividable by I think. 400 are not leap years. Right. 
So 2000 you- was not a leap year, but 2004 was. Our next non-leap year is 2400. Um, well, the way the way a computer wants to think is that it's you know it, the 31st of February, the right? 31st. Yeah, like, <laughs> not the 31st, yeah. but the 31st. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the 31st of of, of yeah. February yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, 19100. Exactly. Yes. Think like a computer. Everything else is. Um, Just count up seconds and store yeah. that as a floating point uh, uh, value in your brain. Yeah, and uh, the, the, this, this podcast and anything that you type in the comments will be minutely recorded in, in a data center in Utah. You know, and... In China, they teach you how to use a mental, alg- a- mental abacus. So I believe we should teach our children to use um, uh, a, 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 a mental adding machine. That's what they've been teaching me in this yeah. room. <laughs> Fuck you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, Abby has been aging in reverse through this podcast. <laughs> the curious case that of Abigail Benjamin Button, button disease. Yeah. Yeah. Abigail Button. Yeah. Putting a button on that podcast. Every, <laughs> every week or so, I have to go down to the beach that makes you old. <laughs> Just to keep from yeah, regressing into the womb. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't a new. I got a new. Uh, I got a new idea for a uh, picture of Dorian Gray style uh, uh, novel now. Um, <laughs> Just my YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Easter Dial. Uh, mm-hmm. I've heard it does that. It does. It does. Yeah. yeah. Makes you look younger. Mm. Or makes you have a haunted painting. That too. Mm. Whichever. Both. Yeah. I thought that was how it worked. The haunted <laughs> painting? Yeah. Yeah, you keep Yeah, you gotta wait paint. several years so that you so that they can paint the haunted painting. You have to yeah. get like two painters to sign off on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on this podcast, we have a we segment. Have a segment. We have a science-based wait, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the science-based segment called Safety, Safety Third. Third. Safety third. Shake hands with danger. Incidentally, if you want to send one of these in, it's wtypod at gmail.com. You should do that. Yeah, we'll try, read it on try, the air. Try and keep the text to about a page. Otherwise, it goes too long. Today's safety third comes from the Balkans. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Hello, Alice, Liam, and Roz. Didn't include guest. No, cancelled. Yeah, no, yeah, sorry, no, Abby's cancelled. Um, <laughs> we cancelled me... for being Russian like Tchaikovsky. <laughs> <laughs> first, let me say how much I love that you found the clip of Shaking Hands with Danger. I had to watch that video while at Engineer Officer Basic School and is in my top five comedies ever made. <laughs> as, ar- as an Army engineer, in addition to learning how to build roads, bridges, and buildings all unlicensed because the army builds in a pre-PE exam world. I got to play around with explosives and (laughs) landmines. Hell yeah. Yeah. This is about as much fun as you would imagine. A lot for explosives, but not so much for the landmines. This led to a large number of safety issues, especially when I was in Bosnia, working in humanitarian demining. Shake leg with danger. (laughs) Yes. Shake toe you cap you with danger. The, you the right Deny for years in. that you were doing anything involving danger. Right one <laughs> up, da, 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 and shake it all of that. On my first day on the job, we were visiting a site that was being demined by a group of Bosnian soldiers. As we walked up to the campfire, where all meetings began with coffee, uh, two soldiers were hiking out of the woods that were being demined. I asked as they approached if they had found anything, and in response, one of the soldiers threw an unexploded rocket-propelled grenade like a football to me. (laughs) 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 Classic Bosnian prank. (laughs) We call it hot potato. (laughs) These style RPGs were known not to explode when shot because they had to have a certain number of revolutions to arm leaving them very much alive and liable to go off when handled. So I watched as it spiraled towards me, 
wondering how many <laughs> rotations it had left in it before becoming live and did my best Jerry Rice impression to catch the RPG without letting any part of me touch the fuse at the head and risk setting it off. As my heart was calming down, I went to hand the RPG back to the soldiers who, who said, laughing, oh yeah, we disarmed it first. <laughs> <laughs> Should have passed it back to them. <laughs> Assholes, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Also, while in Bosnia, my boss begged to be taken out in the field with us. He was a desk jockey and never got to go out and wanted to have more of a story to tell than that I sat in a walled-off compound for half a year. You would not catch me doing this shit in the army. Yeah. I will sit in my <laughs> compound. Let me, let me sit at the desk, yeah. <laughs> Finally, the timing and the pleading worked out for him, and he tagged along on a trip to a mountain site where a family of Bosnian brothers held off a Serbian advance along a narrow road corridor next to the Drina River. It sounds like a sort of Bosnian 300 Spartan situation. Mm. <laughs> well, the 300 Spartans would have found it a lot easier with anti-personnel mines, I think. Yeah, mine. Mm -hmm. That's a point. They like a thought. cheat code to the Persians. Yeah. This is the issue with the Spartan military legacy, is it's really exaggerated. You know, they weren't <laughs> very good, and this was due in part to, you know, the militaristic culture actually not producing a great military, but also they never thought to use mines. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the Bosnian brothers held out the Serbian advance along a narrow road corridor next to the Drino River. It was full of mines and unexploded ordnance due to the brothers' efforts, and I figured it'd be a good show for my boss. It was that type of thinking that almost left me as a red mist. My personal policy was not to wear armor in a minefield, as if you hit something, you were dead regardless. So oh, why be a that is that is that is Liam logic right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I don't I need to wear a seatbelt. I'll be thrown I, clear. I, I yeah. do yeah. wear a seatbelt. I was talking more about the heritage run uh, where I told Roz that a no medics were coming for us, and even if they did, we would be marinara long before they got to us. <laughs> and he said, "Okay," <laughs> the yeah. way we went. And so why be hot and sweaty, you know? But my boss insisted on wearing his uh, armor, right? Pathetic. <laughs> when we got to the minefield and I drank our obligatory, obligatory coffee with the Serbian soldiers working on this site, I turned to my boss and told him that this was an active demining site, so don't assume anything is cleared ever, only walk where others are walking, and stay the hell out of the way. Hmm. He was very mindful of my directions for all of two minutes. For as we climbed the hillside, one of the Serbian soldiers, soldiers rushed over to tell us they had found a daisy-chained cluster of anti-personnel and anti-tank mines if we wanted to go take a look. My boss pulled out his camera and rushed forward, <laughs> so excited <laughs> oh, to get neat. a picture. It Ooh. did not register to him what daisy-chained meant, or to hear that there were six anti-personnel mines or that these were freshly uncovered and had not been deactivated yet. My boss was a great admirer of the film, a Serbian film. <laughs> are we looking uh, at them in the picture? I, I'm not sure what we're I looking at. I can't see anything, pictures. it just looks like ground to me, but then I get yeah. untrained eyes. Uh, mm. The setup was though that if one of them was triggered, the whole lot would go off, about 50 pounds of explosive, give or take. He was walking forward to get a nice close-up of the anti-tank mine, and was stepping directly on an anti-personnel mine when I caught up with him and dragged him back by his armor. I cursed him out and had him escorted back to the vehicles to think about what he had done and, waited, and, and to wait for us to finish the day. On the plus side, the picture turned out to be great. You know, you can spot the hidden landmines here. Oh yeah, I can yeah. kind of see one on the right just yeah. underneath the, the toe there, and there's yeah. one on the left Un there. Under the Maybe this is oh, one. Oh, Jesus, yeah. yeah. There's the a third one over there near the Fuck. red match head looking thing. God, you, you must have good eyes, though. I'd have stepped on that. Oh, I'd definitely step. I'd step on any landmine anywhere. Like, I would have mm. no, I, I, there's no way. I'd be killed instantly in any battlefield. Um, I mean, I can only see three. He said six, right? Yeah. Six, yeah, six so. anti personnel and an anti tank. I assume this is what the, um, what the uh, uh, stakes are for. I will say there is one trick to detecting mines, which is you sort of, you click on a square, right? And the number shows up, <laughs> and then you know that there's probably 
mines. You know, I, 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 I have use bees yeah. to detect mines now. I, I have a foolproof. I have a foolproof technique for detecting uh, whether or not a miner is present in an area, and that's uh, you walk around, and if you if you're losing a leg suddenly, you have detected that a mine is in the area. Yes. and you've also neutralized it. So absolutely, that's a good point, Yeah. The finest mine clearance techniques of 1941 Stalingrad. You can do that up to twice. <laughs> <laughs> you got arms, don't you? What's the matter? You got like six freebies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good luck in your struggles from JC. Well, I hope they aren't Thank as bad you, as Jesus. yours. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank say. you, Army Officer Jesus. Thank you, Mr. Corbin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Corbin. Yes. Our next episode is on the Boston Molasses Disaster. Does anyone have any commercials before we go? You should listen to Kill James Bond. Oh, that's um, a good idea. You should watch Philosophy Tube. Yeah, yeah, please do if you, if you don't. I mean, I do put a lot of work into it. Uh, yes. And it does, have a, it does have a Patreon. So if you would like me to, uh, to continue making the things that I make, then uh, why not consider signing up to that? Uh, it's not like this, this podcast where you get bonus stuff. Uh, no, well, it's, it's I mean, good. You do yeah. get rewards, like you know, you can get like little cards or books or stuff, and you get your name in the credits. You, get, um, you could get some philosophy up. in a tube. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, you can. yeah. Nice. Oh man, I'm gonna make Pillsbury Grands after we're done this. <laughs> also, like if I'm in a TV show or a play or something, like watch it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good yeah. idea. Fo- follow, that's, follow, follow Abby on Twitter. At, yeah, is it Philosophy Tube? Philosophy it's underscore at, Tube. At philosophy Tube. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. All right, it's a podcast. That was a podcast, folks. Uh, all right. Four. 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 <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. It's a Taking a nine iron to my minefield. Yeah. <laughs>